Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> so this talk is basically about keeping a company aligned, which Intercom is now, I guess, like when we started it was 2011, there was like four of us. Uh, there's now like 470 something of us. And, uh, and it turns out they don't all know exactly what we want them to do. Uh, it's basically one way of thinking about it. Or and put another way, it turns out we don't know exactly what we should do to help them do exactly what they need to do. Uh, but on a very, very abstract level, what I'm saying is we're not all fully aligned. And I think as, any pro uh, as you move beyond basically outside of your own brain, alignment becomes this challenge. Are you and your co-founders aligned? Are your co-founders and your first hires aligned? And so on and so forth. And a lot of this is just simply about uh, aligning on strategy. That is the exact thing you're doing. Or more often, frankly, what you're not doing. Uh, and I think like, one of the sort of biggest tests I sort of see in companies is a sense of like everyone doing good stuff, but not all of it being the thing that we've chosen to do. It's very rare you hire somebody who actually does fundamentally the wrong shit. Uh, it's just you know, not what you've chosen to do at any given point. Uh, and that's why I like this quote from Michael Porter, which is like, the essence of strategy is actually not about all the cool things we're gonna do. It's about like all, you know, the power in a statement and the declarative statement about what we're focusing on is all the things that you're actually specifically not focusing on. So the talk's kind of four parts. Uh, why does any of this stuff matter? Uh, how would you inform what you build, how to keep your company aligned, and lastly, like, how do you uh, sort of grow a company and how do you maintain this sense of shared strategy across the entire uh, sort of workforce? So I often get this question when I start a talk like this, which is shut up, Des, go back to jobs to be done, talk to about product shit. You know, no one wants to hear this alignment crap. And, uh, and I think it's really important. I actually think all the other shit doesn't matter if you actually don't have everyone aligned. And that's why I talk about topics like this. It's become a far bigger challenge as we've grown from like from 4 to 40, from 40 to 140, and to where we are today. Um, one way of thinking about like an unaligned company is something like this. Right? Uh, this is a product team, if you like, without a clear strategy. And what, now, every single one of these people is doing good work. They are checking off their tasks, they are fixing bugs, they are adding features, they are doing good work. But it is no sense of shared purpose, which means it's not going anywhere. What you want is something where everyone's working towards a certain goal. You're probably wondering how long that'll take a keynote. The answer is quite a while. Um, <laughs> But it is really important. Like, you need this sense of a shared strategy. And like, it's worth saying that like, your product team being aligned together, which might mean like, you know, one, one org or one set of people being aligned, is great. But it's not enough either, because as you grow, you have to add in all these other functions, like sales, or marketing, or finance, or analytics, or any of those things. Once you cross some perceptual cliff of like 30, 40 people, you realize, we should make it somebody's job to talk to customers. We should make it somebody's job to like, market to customers. And somebody should answer the phone if somebody rings us and wants to buy our product. If you accept those sort of premises for growing your company, you then have a new alignment challenge. Because this team is only one of many teams, and you all need to be aligned on the same page. Uh, and uh, if you're not, you'll end up in a bad world. You'll end up in a world where, say, uh, you're not doing this, right? Your decisions have to ensure that you not only build what you sell, but that you sell what you build. And if there's one phrase or one topic you take from this, is just ask yourself this, do we build the thing that we sell, and do we sell the thing that we build? If the answer is anything other than an immediate yes, and you've actually gone and checked it, uh, you should ask yourself, are we actually on the same page here? Are we making a, a project management app, but actually it's being sold by the marketing team as an agile bug tracker? Are we making a shared collaborative document solution, but it's being sold as a HR solution? You know, making sure that your teams are actually on the same page about what's going out to market and that your development teams are on the same page about what they should build for market is really important. So every decision uh, that you have to make in your product and in your company always highlights a missing principle. So whenever I find, like, you know, if I come, come, like, you know, come into my office and somebody has a list of questions, inevitably there's some sense of the reason they can't answer this for themselves is because I haven't documented the best way we th Intercom thinks about this, or I have and they haven't read it, or in some sense where we don't have this shared value of how to solve this problem. And these decisions can be anything from like, hey, should we build this Marketo integration, or 
Should we you know, build this feature that our competitor has? Or, hey, a big revenue customer wants us to do custom permissions. Should we do that? And the reason these questions bubble up, every time these questions bubble up to you in your role, it simply highlights the fact that you haven't documented your thinking around that area, or the product team hasn't converged on a common sense uh, sort of set of principles as to how to tackle these things. So the biggest way you can keep a company aligned is not by running around desk to desk, micromanaging and making these decisions. You might feel important doing that, but you're actually being a shit manager. Uh, and it's really important, like you, you do get that sense of importance of this sense of, I'm irreplaceable, I'm going nowhere, and you are going fucking nowhere, you know? Um, so, <clears throat> the phrase I often use with, our, with like, you know, folks who run product for us is like, that we, we need to find the generalizable frequent areas and principalize them, basically, right? If something comes up and we can sort of find a general pattern for it, and it's a common thing, we need to answer it in a principled form so that we never have to answer that question again. So and as an example, should we build a JIRA integration? What's the general principle there? Or should we build a Trello? Should we build an Asana? Should we build a Fogbooks? Uh, we can cluster these into a, sort of, in, into a sort of frequent, similar topic. And we can ask, what's our stance in integrations? Or, or how, does, how does Intercom coexist with other software? Or should we integrate with competitors? But like, it's about finding these sort of common points and getting people aligned on that. Here is why we do integrate with everyone. Does everyone understand that? And then once the product came on a page, no one ever asks me this question anymore, which is fantastic. That's where you want to get to. I am replaceable, and I think that's awesome. You know? um, so that's like, the first thing is just why it matters. It's like you can't build a sort of team that is in, at any point of scale beyond, like, I, I don't know, small numbers, like 10 or whatever, without having some sort of sense of documented purpose about what it is you're doing, why you're doing it, and how you go about doing it. Uh, until you get there, you're going to be running around micromanaging and feeling like everything bubbles up to you. Um, in terms of what you build, whether it, now this is true whether it's, whether it's your first startup or whether it's the 50th feature in your second startup, right? Like the, the answers are kind of the same. The, the common things I find myself saying to folks over and over again in this principled form is like, we can only build things that are viable, feasible, and desirable. And if you don't have all three of those, you don't really have a great product or a great feature. Uh, no two are sufficient. So something can be feasible and desirable but if it can't make money, it will not succeed. And Lord knows Silicon Valley produces these things all the fucking time, right? Um, but similarly, something can be like, uh, can make money and can be totally technically feasible, but if it's not actually desirable, it doesn't matter. And Lord knows the SaaS industry certainly spits out a lot of those. So I think it, it's, it's really important to always ask yourself that sort of quick asset test of feasible, desirable, and, uh, and like viable. So, Another thing I often say is just don't solve a rare small problem. And basically some problems are big and some problems are small. And some problems happen all the time. And some problems happen rarely, right? Talking to your, work, uh, to your workmates about what you're working on uh, and communicating uh, responsibilities and states and all that is a big problem and it's a very common problem. And that's why products like Basecamp are like so uh, sort of prolific and successful because they tackle a big real problem. Everyone feels that pain. Uh, something can be a frequent small problem, and that's okay. It means that you can, you'll get a high amount of usage. Maybe you could charge like 99 cent a month or something like that. Or maybe you have so much engagement you can sell ads or something like that. But I mean, if it's frequent enough, it's fine. Similarly, if it's a rare problem, but it's big enough, you'll pay enough money to get rid of it. So it's, again, it's a good space. Unfortunately, a lot of people try, try to go for here. And that's exactly wrong. It's like you can't make that work under any circumstances. People don't care about it. It falls into that category of it's not a big enough problem to solve, basically. Uh, and that's why some problems just persist. Another uh, thing I often bump into in the SaaS space is people who build sort of software products or solutions um, charging a low ticket price per month, but having some fundamental reason why they need to engage with all their customers uh, who sign up. And what this looks like is you have high touch onboarding, which means for most people to get started, they need to talk to somebody in your company, but you don't actually make a lot of money off, the, uh, off them. If you have to talk to somebody to start using Spotify, that conversation you have initially would probably wipe out the first three years of potential revenue from you. 
That's the nature of their business, right? It needs to be automated. If you're running a velocity business, it needs zero touch. If you're running a sort of high money, like low customer account business, yes, you can fly on site with PowerPoint slides and bring, the, bring them out to dinner and all sorts of shit that people do. But, uh, but if you're actually, if, if you're in the low ticket price world, you can't afford to have a buggy product. You can't afford a lot of customer support conversations. You can't afford a confusing product. It's the only way it works. And then the last piece I'd say on this is just around scope. So in general, I, like, I often try to draw this map for folks, which is like, here's a problem somebody has. Uh, I need to grow my business. And here's a solution somebody might have. Well, or sorry, here, here's a desirable outcome for the person. And there are many different paths to get somebody from A to B, but your product chooses a certain narrative. We have a live chat product, for example, where we say, well, you're going to grow an audience, send them messages, get them to your site, qualify them, start conversations, create opportunities, schedule demos, negotiate deals. And <clears throat> we could say that that whole thing is a product, uh, but it's a pretty big product, uh, and it's risky. So we have to work out where do we start solving this problem. Knowing that every product itself is just a specific window of a bigger problem, which is life, uh, you have to work out where do you start and where do you stop in their product. I would generally say start at the first place where you can add value and work out how to transition from the previous place that there is. So if you're saying like, oh, you know, say our tool does email marketing, okay, well, you should definitely optimize on importing those email addresses because you're saying, you're saying you're assuming somebody has a pile of email addresses. Well, let's definitely be really good at integrating with that previous step so that when they start to use your product, they're in good condition. Similarly, like, where do you stop? Well, if the next step is done by a market leader that you don't intend to fight, so if like, the logical thing is, oh, well, at that point, they're going to go to Salesforce and create a record, or at this point, they're going like, to go and file a ticket in Zendesk or something like that, if that's a fight you don't want to have, don't accidentally start it. Uh, just be like, yo, let's set them up for success when they go to Salesforce, or let's integrate with Zendesk or whatever, right? Um, similarly, if the next step is, has loads of different ways that it can be achieved. So if the likely outcome is, oh, well, at this point, you know, if you take, say, payroll processing, right, as a, as a common sort of SaaS app, um, payroll processing is basically done 186 different ways in 186 different countries. Tax is different, uh, rules are different, frequency is, is different, the pay slips are different, everything is different. And <clears throat> if you wanted to do the take, gobble that next step, you have to build 186 different solutions. Or you build something like relatively abstract and say you're on your own. That's probably the better solution here. What I'd say is don't, if you're trying to follow someone through a flow and it significantly diverges into a large amount of small, outcome, of small outcomes, uh, do not try and build that into your software. It will be a complexity nightmare that will not be worth it. And lastly, if there's just something you can't innovate on, so if the next step is they'd phone the customer, you could go and build a VOIP solution, but you're not really going to be able to make any money off that because if they're currently phoning their customer, let them phone their customer. It's not really worth building into your product uh, unless you have a significant way you're going to improve on telephony, in which case, good luck. Um, so to break this down with an actual real example, uh, often times I'll see folks take a workflow like this and they'll be like, this is the workflow of my product. Uh, we're going to publish campaigns and we've got to research leads, send them emails, qualify leads, create prospects and assign to customer success, whatever. And a big like, sort of early days mistake you'll make when you're designing a sort of typical SaaS product or a typical software product in any space is to try and design this one workflow that works for everyone through all of these steps. Uh, it's going to be a nightmare. And it, there's this thing called Gall's Law, which says that basically it's impossible to design a complex system up front. Complex systems are only successful when they've evolved from smaller working systems. You have to start with a small working system. What I'd say in this case is there's actually four different products here, and you need to pick the product that you want to solve. And when you've picked that product, you then say, right, here's where we're coming from. How can we start well here? And how can we integrate well here? So how do we make integration at this point as easy as possible? So wherever they were right beforehand, how do we make that seamless so they can single click start using your product? And similarly, how can we set them up for success when they move on to the next product? Knowing that your product, whether it's project management or whether it's you know, uh, marketing tools or whether it's like bug tracking, you only exist in a time frame uh, alongside IDEs and alongside Google Docs and all sorts of email clients, all sorts of other stuff. Just working out constantly what's the easiest way to knit all this together. 
This generally is what I call the Scopilox principle, which is like no product too big because no one will adopt it, and no product too small because it's then not worth adopting, but finding a scope that's somewhere just right such that it is actually uh, small enough that you can pull it into your, into your like, sort of tool set, but big enough that you'll actually pay for it and that it is actually worth pulling in in the first place. Um, and the very, very, very last piece on this scope uh, analogy is I, I'm sick to death telling people, and anyone who works at Intercom here will say that they're sick of hearing it as well, this idea of cupcakes, which is uh, there are two ways to make a wedding cake, as I'm sure you all know. Uh, <laughs> One of them would be that you can, uh, you can basically make your cake base, make your filling, lastly apply your, apply your icing, and then you sit down to taste it. And the problem when you sit down to taste it then is that you get your first bite of reality at the very, very end of a process. And that's not good. Uh, it's not good because you might, you, will, you might then find out that the cake doesn't work or that chocolate and carrot and vinegar is actually not a nice taste. Or, uh, or any of these things, you don't want to find this out early. You can find, uh, you, sorry, you, you want to find this shit out early, not late. Uh, so what I tell people is, try to cupcake first. So we might say we're going to build a mass marketing email tool that does account-based marketing and integrates with Salesforce, and I'd be like, okay, that's a massive amount of software it's spread across nine months. Show me one elegant workflow that we actually can build, and if we can make that successful, then we can talk about your nine-month project. Uh, and that's what I would often call the cupcake, and in fact, that's become a piece of sort of lingo in Intercom to sort of cupcake something which basically means find the smallest bite that will actually test most things. Engineers often use the phrase spike, meaning like let's just cut through all the layers from like technical viability through to like user experience, and let's just try and solve that one sliver, and if we get that right, then we know we have a solid base to expand. The amount of times trying to do a cupcake and then throwing it out and abandoning the project has saved us months is invaluable, which is a weird thing to say about a process, but it's, it saves us time by showing us what we can't do, what we're not set up to do, or what we're frankly just being idiots trying to do. Uh, it's a very, very useful test, so I'd, I'd encourage you to think about it. So I guess just if, you know, the takeaways from this, section, from this section, if you like, is like build products that are feasible, viable, viable and desirable. Don't solve small, rare problems. And know where to start and stop your product. Um, find that scopey locks point for your initial release, and lastly, think cupcakes and not wedding cakes. So, if you have your product and the, you get to this point in a business where you realize somebody's job should be telling the rest of the world that our product exists, and it can't be just our product team's job, we should hire people, and I believe they're called marketers. Uh, some of my best friends are marketers. Uh, and in fact, for like two years, I ran marketing in Intercom and learned a shitload and a lot of discipline and respect for the craft, and it's certainly for its history. Um, it's Im very important when you add these marketing and then later on sales. In general, we kind of see the world as like product marketing sales in terms of the way you kind of layer them up. Um, it's important that everyone's on the same page. And uh, that page is usually some sense of a mission, and we, we say internally, great products fight for a mission. What is it you're actually trying to do? Like Stripe's mission is firmly to increase the GDP of the internet. Uh, Slack want to be the place where work happens. Intercom want to make internet business personal. Um, Superhuman want to be email designed for work. Uh, Twitter want it to be the heartbeat of the planet. Um, in, in a sense, this mission kind of like it helps you hire, it helps you retain, but it also just helps you kind of get people on a very fluffy version of a page. You can get more specific, but it's worth saying if you don't want to do this thing, you probably shouldn't work in the company that says it's trying to do it. Um, but products also have to represent a set of unique values. Uh, like, so it's not just enough to say like we want to like you know we want to make sales faster or whatever. It's like how, what, what specific? What's your actual opinionated take on this? Um, like. So in Intercom, one of the things we say is like, you know, here's, here's a few of our values. We always design both sides of the conversation. Most tools design for one side of a conversation in business. We always design for both. We believe in a single platform for all conversations. We believe selling never stops. Uh, we believe that we have to integrate with all market. There's like 5,000 marketing technology solutions. If we don't work with them all, it doesn't work. So like, these are our sort of product values. And again, these are the principles, going back to earlier, that stop us answering the questions over and over and over again. They hopefully help guide. But, so you can have your mission, you can have your opinions and values, but it's, uh, it's really important that everyone shares this, right? We believe, one, one phrase we use a lot is we must have the same language from code to customer. So within our Educate product, 
When in the Ruby code, you'll see words like article, conversation, user, etc. Within our marketing for that same product, you'll see you can create articles for your users. We have this con continuity of thought across all levels. Bad shit happens when you don't. So as an example, and I've seen this with companies I've advised or invested in before, um, like product might be saying we're building the right messages to the right people at the right time, but sales might be selling the fastest way to import an email list and start a campaign. They can both be correct, but they're actually out of sync, right? And that's not the actual problem, because if, if all of this was just to work, that's fine. What actually happens is, unfortunately, no matter what way you do it, the salespeople tend to sit in one part of the office, the marketing people tend to sit in another, and the product people tend to want to be in a different office. And, uh, and they all like to iterate. And when they iterate, they get further and further apart. And what that would look like is, they're like, product will say, it's the best targeted messages by channel. And over here, we're saying it's the highest deliverability rates for the lowest prices. And they just get further and further apart, right? If you iterate on product, on marketing, and sales pitches in isolation, you'll come up with very bad ideas. You'll come up with a misaligned product team. They build messy product that's impossible to market. And we've seen a lot of that. Like, you know, if you ever say, we're your all-in-one or your everything platform, that's basically saying, we didn't really know. We just kept building shit. And uh, now <laughs> we told product we basically wanted to do everything. And uh, Similarly, marketing can run campaigns for a fictional product, right? Uh, if, you saw, like, if you saw, for example, Apple's HomePod advertisements, you would have seen this, right? Uh, like, here is a dope thing that we really think is great, or Google Plus' advertising was exactly like this as well. It created a fantasy of an amazing product that just didn't exist, unfortunately. Everything else was great, it's just the product didn't show up. Um, similarly, sales can overpromise and underdeliver and set customers up for failure, and, they, and everyone who doesn't do their job basically makes it somebody else's problem. If product doesn't do the job of coming up with a good idea for a product, it's marketing's problem to try and work out what that is. If marketing says, we're going to make your company amazing, just start using us, it's now sales' job to try and close on that weird-ass promise, right? So you need to actually make sure that people are on the same page and that they're not just handing complexity around the, around the org. And this, again, comes back to this idea that we must build what we sell so that we can sell what we build. And if we don't do both of those things, there's a problem. So, the core parts of alignment for me are like, you need this unique uh, sort of vision or mission for your product and your set of values, like your opinionated take on whatever it is, be it bug tracking, be it payroll processing. What's your unique take on it? Uh, secondly, product sales and marketing have to share a sort of sense of the message, a sense of what the purpose is. And thirdly, iterating these things independently. So if you see the marketing team in the corner working on a version, well, and there's no product voice in that meeting, they will come up with some great marketing. And in fact, they're going to put Google Ads live, and they're going to optimize those ads to get clicks. And those clicks will start to look more like free, and, you know, and like you know, Taylor Swift, and all sorts of shit will end up in the ads, because that's what gets clicked. It's just totally independent to the product you're selling, right? Um, and lastly, ensure for the love of God, that you sell what you build and you build what you sell. So the last piece I'll just talk about, which is kind of more related to the phase Intercom is at, and I know that some people here are further along than Intercom and some people who are like maybe earlier uh, in their company journey. Um, and like one thing that happened to us is we kind of, you know, we, we announced last January, I think it was, that we'd hit 50 million in error and we were a few hundred people and like the company was just starting to get big. And, uh, and we had this real sense of like, what got you here won't get you there. Like, because we were starting to talk to customers who were asking us for like the two year roadmap. And we're like, whoa, we, we, we only really think six weeks at a time. How does this shit work? <laughs> and, uh, and I guess like, you know, every product uh, company sort of starts out uh, with intuition, with inspiration, with gut, and with feel. Like, kind of like, look, I, I know that there's a problem here and I really want to solve it, and I'm, I'm solving it for me and it works. Um, but that doesn't scale if your plan is to scale, uh, which, which isn't everyone's plan, which is totally fine. But um, if you do actually want to go and like, uh, have more customers, at some point you need to like, get more people involved. And uh, it won't work if everything has to flow through you because it's your sort of feel for the world and what it needs that is, is what you're trying to power the company by. And even if it did scale, it's not a good idea because you're going to be increasingly uh, further away from your customers or increasingly further away from like, the sense of the market. You're, you know, whether, you want, whether you want it or not, you're, like, as the company grows and you get specialized, there are more people who are more experts than you. And if you're not listening to them, you're in a bad position. So <clears throat> a lot of this comes down to like, 
how you actually plan the future of your product. And in general, <clears throat> most roadmaps are kind of formed of like a various set of inputs. People don't, I think it's worth actually trying to formalize this in your own company. We have done it many times. But just basically, what actually inputs into our roadmap? Do we care what our customers say? Do we care about the health of our product? Do we care what sales are saying? What our competitors are doing? What are new ideas? What's, why are people quitting? Uh, what features are live that we need to churn on? Like, do we care? And if so, what's the ratio? To what degree do we care about all of these? And how you allocate your, allo allocate your time, and your time being like the people on the roadmap it's effectively, uh, across all these is actually crucial, right? Early days, for example, you're doing only new ideas because you have no customers and you have no product health to be worried about. So you can totally invest, invest your whole time in new ideas. But over time, it gets more complex. You have, at the very least, a customer base to be accountable for, and you must listen to them. When they quit, you must understand why. Uh, you don't always get to choose. This isn't one of these things where you, sit, where you should stare at it on a whiteboard and be like, okay, we'll spend 80% over here, because sometimes it'll get chosen for you. Two years ago, we had a problem where like, we were busy deep in this land here telling the world how great it is to iterate on product, whereas we actually took our eye off product health. Uh, specifically, as we got a lot more customers, uh, we were sending a lot more emails and a lot more notifications, and <coughs> architecturally, things started to the creak. And while we were sitting here talking about the future of like, what the messenger should do, we, our, our like, infrastructure team was like, yo, y'all don't get to have an opinion on that for the next six months. We've got other shit to be doing. And we're like, oh, well, that's weird, because we just had this road mapping session, and they're like, rip it up. <laughs> uh, which is totally the right thing to do. And we, we went and we fixed all the problems, but like, we needed that input. We were, we were numb to that input for quite a while, for too long. Um, Similarly, like, there's like a different type, different versions of this require sort of different amounts of, uh, different ways of working, let's say. So sometimes if you're working on new ideas or like future iterations of existing ideas, you can speculate and you can try new shit. You can say, hey, look, this doesn't exist before and no one's asking for it, but I think it's worth trying. And if you're in this land, yes, you can be speculative, open-ended. It's okay if, if you have to abandon the product and be like, hey, that didn't work, move on. Um, you have an opportunity to differentiate your company here. You can be like, all right, well, if this works, it'll be a signature feature of our to-do list. Um, however, sometimes you're just addressing a problem that you know exists, and it's defined in sort of very clean ways to you. People are quitting because we don't, blah, blah, blah. And you're like, okay, well then, in that world, you actually don't want to go off to the forest and be like, now let me think about what the nature of a Marketo integration is, right? It's actually genuinely pretty uh, obvious what you need to build. And, and you need to not have to like, have these ridiculous exploration phases. Sometimes it's useful just to be like, hey, look, we have a KPI for this. We know, you know we don't want to fail. We basically, everyone's telling us the exact same thing and we just need to build it. Uh, let's just get, get the product out there. I think it's important to have those two different gears in your company. Uh, because all of your work doesn't necessarily fall into one bucket or the other. So you need to be able to, like, your teams need to be able to adapt to both. Uh, it took us a while to get there, but it is quite valuable. Lastly, something that, uh, you know, again, it gets more important as you, uh, uh, as you start to, like, instrument and scale a product team, which is, like, you need to build stuff that gets used. And, uh, and we often use the phrase revenue hypothesis, which basically means in what way will this get used? Or what's our expectation of this feature if we put it live? Will it help us close more sales deals? Or will it decrease churn? Or will it increase engagement? Or will people, more people sign up on our site because of it? Or will it let us be truly unique in the market? Uh, I think it's useful to have this discussion up front, because oftentimes it'll inform exactly what it is you build and indeed how you build it. But I think it, you know, the exact opposite of this is throw it out there and see what happens. But it's, uh, and like that can work, and again, you get away with that in the early days, but as you sort of start, try to become a more predictable business in some ways, it's useful to have these discussions up front. Um, adding features, just as a side note, like just to close sales deals is the most tempting thing that you have to never do. It's tempting because you'll get offered it all the time. If you do it, it, it basically produces consulting where, like, where every single tab is a new set of customer demands. And it'll start over a long enough time frame, you look like the file matrix or any of those. But in general, like the way I talk about this is basically, what percentage of your customers use it? Here is your product. Here is two ideas you had that maybe weren't that important. And then over here, you've got, well, they said they'd quit because of this, or they, we, just, we just did this once for that one person, or hey, look, we got some good ARR off that feature. Now, <clears throat> if all of this works and you're like, oh, but Des, look at our revenue, it's all working, I would say like, this isn't some product purist bullshit. You actually pay back that complexity in sales, marketing, support, customer success, et cetera, right? Your product is now miles wide and inches deep, but it's dangerous. 
It doesn't come for free to simply go through like one of these, let's just keep adding shit on and every new thing can be an extra 50 bucks and in a long enough time frame we're going to have the ultimate king of all widgets up. It's not where you want to be because it's a nightmare to market, it's a nightmare to maintain, there's bugs everywhere. It's, it, you know, it, ultimately, you pay every single cost, you just get the revenue up front. And um, it's worth saying that if you follow all this, like, none of this will protect you from competition. So, in, a, in SaaS specifically, because of the nature of a domain, every feature you work on will either fail to get adopted by your customers, in which case you kill it, fine, or if it is successful, it'll get copied by all your customers. That's the other side of it. And the reason for that is that none of our features are that groundbreaking. We're not working on augmented reality. We're usually working on like taking business data from one place and putting it in a different place. And, uh, <clears throat> and the model for this you should think about is the Kano model. This is the last thing I'll say because I know I'm tight for time. Basically, Kano says that like every single feature that's breakthrough will become table stakes over time. Uh, to give you an example, uh, I flew in from San Francisco a few days ago uh, with a, a British Airways, and when I was landing, they gave me a breakfast smoothie, and I was like, that is nice. Uh, and that smoothie probably cost them very little, but I was very delighted by it. And that's an interesting sort of uh, place to be. On the flip side, they probably spent hundreds of millions of dollars making sure that my plane lands on the runway, and I didn't really give a shit, right? Uh, like, I wasn't like, oh my God, you got me here. You know, uh, but I guess what I'd say is like, there, every feature is in one, or, one of three categories, right? It's either one of these delightful things where it's a small investment that your customers really value. But once everyone does it, it then becomes a sort of performant feature, which is like, hey, how good is the breakfast smoothie? We all get one, but how good is yours? And then on a long enough time horizon, it ends up in this category of uh, like, like landing on the runway, where it's like, well, the bare minimum you should be doing is a breakfast smoothie. And I guarantee you in two years' time, if you don't get a breakfast smoothie after a transatlantic flight, you'd be like, this is bullshit, right? <laughs> That's just the nature of it. Um, so just quickly on, on building a moat. Um, the old moats of software, the way in which you protected yourself, was these things here. Uh, and there's three new moats that I'll very quickly touch on. Uh, basically, if you can turn your product into a platform, and make it the norm for businesses to build on top of you, that's a very strong place to be. If you can build a community of people around your shared ideas, which is exactly what the folks at SaaStock are doing here, as evidenced by this room, that's a very strong place to be. If you can build a brand, a crisp identity that's relevant and resonant with people you're trying to sell to, that's a very good place to be. They're the moats that will actually protect you. Features will not protect you in the world of SaaS. They really won't. Even look at Facebook, Snapchat, where there's way more room for differentiation. Features do not protect you. Uh, this is something we've been working on for quite a while. We've basically built this platform. We've built this community. We've built all this content to grow this brand. This is what we've been doing for ages. Um, so to recap on uh, what there's this section, I would say make room for the, all the inputs you need in your roadmap. Consider how you weight those inputs. Make sure your product team can build the table stake stuff along with the innovative stuff. Uh, have that revenue hypothesis for all the work that you do. Be wary of adding features based on anecdotes, especially anecdotes from your sales folks that will close the deal. And bear in mind, have an actual plan for what's in your moat because no feature will help you get copied. Get everyone aligned around the mission and the strategy and the decisions will all take care of themselves. Thank you very much.